day on a mountain pass in Arizona near the border of Mexico. The front tire of their van gave way, or the, the edge of the road gave way, and the van rolled down a mountainside, about halfway down, and became lodged against a tree. Chris's mom, Dawn, was trapped inside the vehicle, unable to get out, and because of the mangled metal, couldn't extract her from there. Chris was able to crawl out through a broken window of the van. Just shortly prior to that, they had seen uh, a Border Patrol helicopter, and so he had enough sense to think to grab the, uh, the broken off uh, rear view mirror or side mirror on the vehicle. And he climbed back up onto the ridge onto the roadway in hopes that maybe he could use the mirror to signal the Border Patrol helicopter that they had seen. But when he got up onto the edge of the road, there was no helicopter to be seen. There was no one around. He, had, he knew he had to do something, and so Chris began to walk on the road, hoping maybe they would pass a car, pass somebody might be seen by the Border Patrol in some way could get help for his mom. But there was nobody out there. And as he walked, a short while off, there was a man in the distance on the road walking toward him. The man's name was Manuel. Manuel, a few days prior, had crossed the border from Mexico into the United States. He had crossed the border illegally, coming to the U.S. because he had four children in Mexico he was trying to figure out how to take care of in hopes that he could cross the border, he could find work in Arizona or one of the border states and be able to be able to raise money and send it back to his family. For the last few days, Manuel has been hiding and dodging. He originally crossed with a group, but because of the, the border, tro- border patrol trying to, to find them, they've become separated, and he was by himself. In the last few days, he'd spent his time hiding and ducking, trying to make his way further into the United States. And Manuel looked up, and he saw there in the desert, alone, a nine-year-old boy. Reporters later would ask him if he had any second guesses or doubts about what he would do next, seeing this boy in there, knowing that being seen by this child, approaching this child, would mean the loss of his freedom and certain deportation back across the border. Did he think about running? Did he think about hiding? He said, no, he never did. And he never regretted the choice that he made. And he saw that nine-year-old boy alone there in the desert. He knew something was wrong. There's no reason a child should be here in the desert like this. And he thought of his own children. And so Manuel approached Chris. And as he approached Chris, he began through his broken English, and the boy knew a few words of Spanish, tried to understand what was going on, and soon kind of got the sense that there had been an accident as the boy tried to motion that the van had rolled and such. And so... Chris took Manuel back to the accident and showed him the van and the accident. There was nothing Manuel could do as far as to extract Chris's mom from the vehicle, and so he came back up to the side of the road. By that point, it's beginning to get dark. Temperatures in the desert are likely going to drop that night around 30 degrees, and they knew he had to do something. And so this man who is uh, despised by many and one who had been hiding for a few days decided to build the largest fire he could possibly build. He put together a fire in hopes that it would be seen by the Border Patrol in hopes that this one who had been hiding would now be discovered. So he built a large fire, and he and Chris sat beside each other, and as it got colder, he eventually took his coat off. Chris only had a T-shirt and shorts on, put it around Chris. And in a short while, Chris fell asleep. Manuel stayed up through the night, protecting the boy with him, occasionally going back and checking on his mom until finally breathing stopped, and he knew that the mother had died. In the morning, Chris uh, Manuel knew he had to do something, and so um, he left uh, Chris there with the fire and began to walk. After a couple miles of walking on the road, he came across some hunters. He was able to flag them down. They fortunately had a satellite phone on them, and they were able to call. And of course, in no time, Border Patrol, paramedics, you know, the normal thing you would expect, as Chris is quickly taken away by an ambulance and then traveled and, and flown to, by helicopter to a hospital, Manuel is placed in handcuffs and put in custody of Border Patrol. Shortly after they begin to hear the story, the Border Patrol agent comes up, removes the handcuffs, and apologizes to him for doing that. It's his, his protocol. But it does mean he's lost his freedom. An unlikely hero. 
one that for many of us, for many we look and we see and we say, this is the person. This is an illegal. This is the person who's broken the law. We judge and we condemn simply by virtue of his birth and his identity. But he is an unlikely hero who's shown mercy. He rescued a boy who likely would not have survived the night without him. Fortunately, the Border Patrol, they give him an option. Rather than being deported, they said they will let him walk back across the border. And so they take him to Nogales, Arizona, to the border there. And he walks back across the border into Mexico. He wonders what happens to Chris. He wonders what happens to the story. He's an unlikely hero. He never does attempt to cross the border again. His life is forever changed by the experience. And, of course, Chris's is as well. It's in a story of an unlikely hero, one who many might look at, and simply by virtue of his birth, by virtue of actions, we would reject, we would criticize. But he's one who shows mercy, and one who sees, and one who rescues. Our Bibles are filled with stories of unlikely heroes. We could probably spend time thinking of them people we would never expect, people that are rejected and outcast, and yet somehow God uses them to do amazing things and to do the unexpected. Luke chapter 17, starting at verse 11, where we'll be focused today, is a story of an unlikely hero, one who by virtue of his birth is rejected, but is, an unlo- but is used as a hero. In the story, Jesus is traveling from Galilee to Jerusalem. Geographically, Galilee sits in the north. In the middle is Samaria. In the south is Judea, where Jerusalem is at, the capital city. Jesus is traveling from Galilee to Jerusalem, he's told. And as he is traveling down, he's traveling south. It says he gets near the border of Galilee and Samaria, and he enters into a village there. As he goes into the village, there are ten men who approach Jesus. But they don't get too close because we're told they have leprosy. And because they have leprosy, because they have this skin disease, they are outcast from society. They could never get too close. The law demands that as they, if they walk through a community, they, walk through, they have to call out in advance leprosy, leprosy. They have to declare to everyone around them that they are people untouchable, people to be stay away from. And so they keep their distance from Jesus, but they call out to him, have mercy on us, have pity on us. Suffering has a way of bringing unlikely comrades together. People that maybe in other circumstances would would never have associated, but it seems to be there are ten men who have come together, unlikely comrades, because of their suffering. And they call out to Jesus to have mercy, to have pity upon them. I do wonder what it is that they're actually asking of Jesus. Maybe they don't even know. All they know is they are rejected, they are outcast, they are untouchable, unlovable, and they need mercy. It's one of the lessons I perhaps have have learned some over these last few years of pandemic and things. Sometimes I don't know what to pray. I've discovered that for centuries the church has often prayed the simple prayer, Lord, have mercy. So trusting that God perhaps knows better than we do and understands better than we do the circumstances. It's acknowledgement that we don't really know. And it's acknowledgement that we need God to do something. We need him to intervene. And so we pray, Lord, have mercy. They call out to Jesus, have mercy on us. Jesus hears them, sees them, but does something kind of unique for many of the healing stories. Think about it. Most of the healing stories that we see, Jesus, he sees somebody, he might even reach out and touch somebody, he heals them on the spot. Healing happens immediately. They rejoice, they celebrate. But in this occurrence, he sees these 10 men, they have asked him for mercy, and Jesus says, go show yourself to the priest. To send them to the priest is to send them to be inspected. The priest had this role in society that 
that he was the one who determined whether or not somebody was clean or unclean. And if a person who had leprosy, who was out, ostracized from the community, the only way they could get back into the community was to present themselves to the priest. He would inspect their body. He would declare that they are no longer leprous. They are now healed, that they, they are clean, and they could be welcomed back into the community. And Jesus says to these 10 men, go show yourself to the priest. Surprisingly, perhaps, they go. All 10 of them leave and turn. There is no evidence that anything has changed about their life or their circumstances. Nothing is different. They are still as leprous as they, was, as they were before. They are still as outcast and ostracized as before. But they go. Sometimes faith is like that. It means going when there's no evidence of anything is different. It means following in obedience when nothing has changed. And there's no evidence that anything will change. But it says as they are going, as they are on their way to the priest, wherever he is at, wherever they are headed, they realize something. The leprosy that ravages their body is no more. Leprosy often causes a loss of feeling. and I, I, You can't wonder, were they walking along the path? And all of a sudden, one of them stepped on a sharp stone. and I, I haven't felt that in a long time. The realization dawns on them, one particularly, that they have been healed. One of them turns and goes back to Jesus comes back to Jesus, and he says, he, he worships and he praises God in a loud voice. I like Luke for that. It had to have made an impression upon Luke when it, you know, in, in the story. Made an impression upon somebody, because he didn't just come back and worship and praise God. He came back, and with a loud voice, praised God. Some, you know, some people praise God loudly, Right? For some of us that like to be quiet and, and a little more reserved, sometimes it's like there are people that kind of make us nervous when they get that loud. This guy, it made an impression apparently on everybody because he was like, he came back and in a loud voice, he praises God for what has happened. And he bows before Jesus and he worships. He expresses his gratitude to Jesus, his thankfulness for his healing. Jesus asks the question, were, were, there, what happened? were there not 10 people? What happened to the other nine? Why is this one, why is this least likely of all one, the one who came back? Well, we find out he is not just one other man, he is a Samaritan. A man who by his birth, choices outside of his control, was ostracized and included, excluded. Not only did the leprosy say he was not welcome, but his birth said he is unwelcome. He is the least likely, the unlikely hero to come back to glorify and to praise God. As I read and I studied this passage, like I do with so many passages and so many of the stories, I ask this question and I struggle with the question, why this story? Why here? I've said this before, but somebody somewhere calculated up and tried to estimate the, if they added the total amount of time of all the stories that we have in the New Testament, in the Gospels, of the life of Jesus. And they figured they come out to, we have about 30 days worth of stories and time covered. Now, we know Jesus' active ministry was at least about three years, so we have three years but there's only about 30 days worth of activity do we have contained. Another gospel writer would say, if all the stories of what Jesus did were, contain, were to be written, they would not were to be written down. There would not be enough books to contain them. So why Luke? Why this story? What was it that made people remember it? What was it made him tell? Why did Luke tell it? Why did he tell it here? What is it about this miracle? 
miracle of all the perhaps hundreds of others that this one was chosen. And why here? I think because this man, the unlikely hero, teaches us two things. Two things the context tells us. Immediately before, in chapter 17, in the verses prior, Jesus tells them a parable, a story. He's talking to his disciples. He says, suppose one of you has a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Will he say to the servant, come in and come in from the field, come along down and sit down and eat? And he goes on and tells the story. He's like, no, that's not what he's going to do. He's going to tell the servant, come inside, fix my dinner, take care of things, clean up the house, put things away, and then maybe when you're done, you can go eat. Why? Because he's a servant. It's what the servants do. He hasn't done anything dramatically or stunning. He's simply done what would be expected and obvious. This unlikely Samaritan is the one who does what is expected and what is obvious. What is the right response to the mercy of God? What is the right response to the love and the grace of God? Is it not worship? Is it not love? Is it not obedience? Nine men, ten men, experience the mercy of God. Ten men experience healing. And sometimes, yes, God's mercy is often shown and given to those who do not acknowledge or not even going to come back and say thank you. But one man does what is obvious, what is normal, what is routine, what would be expected in response to God's mercy. He comes back and he praises God and glorifies him in a loud voice, we're told. He does what is obvious. Love is the obvious response to mercy, the expected response. And holiness is love. Obedience is love. It is the obvious response. And this unlikely hero sees it. The second thing that we see happening in this passage and this unlikely hero carries out for us is he sees what nobody else seems to see. And that is that the kingdom of God has come. In the verses that follow, a discussion will begin to ensue this, about when will the kingdom of God come? When will you establish your kingdom? And Jesus, in response to the Pharisees' questioning about when the kingdom of God would come, he says this, The coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed, nor will people say, there it is or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst. The unlikely hero sees what nobody else sees. The kingdom of God has come. For the others, perhaps, Jesus is a miracle worker, a faith healer. But this man sees beyond the stories and realizes that the kingdom of God is in their midst. God has come. And he returns back to Jesus, glorifying and praising God. Because his healing is not simply a healing. His healing is the kingdom of God in their midst. It is God setting things to right. It is God restoring. It is a glimpse and a brokenness to what is there and to what is unseen. He sees what nobody else sees. See, the kingdom of God is, perhaps sometimes when we, when we want to declare the, the kingdom of God has come, it, it seems sometimes for us almost false because we live in a world that is broken. There's an exercise that I learned recently you could try to do to maybe to help you kind of understand what it means that the kingdom of God is in our midst and that it's here. And that is if you take one hand and you cover an eye and you put out your arm and you can see it. Cover this eye because this isn't going to work if I do this wrong. <laughs> your hand is there, is it not? You can see it. 
But if you move your hand over here, can you see your hand? Jonathan probably can because he went the other way. <laughs> you can't see it, can you? Is it still there? The kingdom of God is in our midst. Paul says he sees with the world dimly in a glass. One day we will see. And there are moments in those glimpses, and for this man, just for a brief moment, he sees what is there and what is true. But well, for most of us, we cannot see it. And because we cannot see it, we say it is not there. He sees. He knows. The kingdom of God is present. An unlikely hero. Luke chooses a Samaritan. One who is outcast and rejected, one not worthy of being in the community. And even worse, he's a leper. But he declares and sees the kingdom of God has come. He is the one who understands and rightly responds to the mercy of God with worship, with obedience. The kingdom of God has come and is. Let's pray together.